Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfeld Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. The following special edition of SciTech Central is part of WUCF's American Graduate Initiative. It also continues Spotlight Education, a week of programming that examines how creativity and dedication to teaching all children is making a real difference in Central Florida and across the nation. Coming up, an Orlando High School student is helping create a groundbreaking app for autistic children. I think that it can give them necessary emotional skills to bond with one another. And unleashing the creativity of inventors, artists, and designers. We have a number of really talented people that have kind of come out of the woodwork to see their own dreams become a reality. And that's a wonderful thing. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Many people believe teaching more science and math is important for both students and the future of our economy. But pre-K is not usually thought of as the place to start. A new academy in Central Florida has other ideas. Among educators, a consensus has emerged that STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, is essential for a 21st century education. The Amazing Explorers Academy in Oviedo, Florida, is doing something new, bringing STEM to the pre-K set by stimulating learning through hands-on activities. Children learn by doing and by being involved. We often think of young children in the sensory motor stage of development, which is where they use all of their senses to find out about their world. And so if we can integrate as many of those senses into the activities that we're doing in the classroom, it's a natural fit for what they already do. Every space, and you wouldn't believe it, has up to 20 activities that are embedded and that are scaffolding in every single area of the school. They are actually connected to the standards to make it more intentional for the educators to understand that they're not just there doing something or playing, that that has a purpose. That activity at the end will actually allow them to discover new knowledge. When we look at a model that allows children to think, that encourages them and invites them to think and to question, that whole process is setting the stage for children to know that if they have a question, if they want to learn something, if they want to find out, they can do it. Well, I was just looking at a crab, which had a huge claw, so that I was just asking myself, what do they use their claw for? An important aspect of the curriculum is physical movement. Children learn better when they move. As a matter of fact, adults learn better when they move. It's called kinesthetic learning. The more senses you use, the more neurons are firing in the brain, the more pathways are made that will help you recall and remember. The brain is an amazing part of your body, and most people already know that you have a right and a left hemisphere, and the brain's divided in half. What most people don't know is that across the top of your head, you have the motor cortex, which motor means movement. So if you were combining music, movement, and academics, you're now firing all four parts of your brain. So your whole brain is engaged in the learning process. Teachers often blend several methods of learning to ensure the lesson is reaching each student. We actually encourage being different and, and finding your own language. We expose them to all different technologies, medium, ways of expressing themselves artistically, musically. So we're actually providing them a platform, a canvas, an empty canvas, so they can become all that they can be. The Academy also brings in members of the community to share their experience and expertise. See all that fire? 
When I was first asked to do this, I thought, oh, how in the world am I going to teach three-year-olds anything? It was just hard for me because I've had 25 years of high school teaching. But, and you don't dumb it down. I hate that word. You don't water it down. You just figure out a way to explain to three and four-year-olds the scientific concepts. And they are so bright. It's just absolutely amazing what they actually can learn. It, it never ceases to amaze me. In the end, it's about making pre-K education more effective by getting the kids involved. We believe that children are not recipients of information, but we see them as co-participants in the learning process. When children actually participate in their learning process through hands-on activities, through play, in a fun way, we're actually able to build on their natural ability and curiosity. At Orlando's Oak Ridge High School, a magnet program is addressing the growing need for commercial pilots and aerospace engineers by giving students real-world training. The first year program that I teach is the simulation. The second year program, we start getting them onto radio-controlled airplanes. In my third year, the student will actually come in and build their own aircraft. They determine was the construction worthwhile, did the plane work for what I wanted it to do. What we were doing was taxiing the plane, which is just learning how to maneuver your plane on the ground. I want to be a mechanical engineer, I want to build aircraft, so I'm not too much of a flyer, so I like to be in class making the decision and the measurements of the aircraft and so swing it. We were inspecting an oil rig and as we were landing there was an explosion. We had the option of rescuing the three people that were in the rig or letting the Coast Guard yeah, take right care of it. Gone. You can't land there. It's teaching me how to think critically, stuff that happens in real life. Microprocessors, computer-controlled laser cutters, 3D printers, high-tech tools provide almost limitless opportunities for inventors to bring their ideas to life. But they can be prohibitively expensive. An innovative shared workspace in Central Florida is helping break through that barrier. Every inventor knows the adage, the right tool for the right job. But how to unleash individuals' creativity when tools can cost tens of thousands of dollars? Factor in downtown Orlando offers one solution to that problem. Factor is a makerspace. The concept of a makerspace is basically a place for people to kind of come, utilize tools they wouldn't be able to afford, to educate the community on how to use these tools. Factor is a labor of love for founder Douglas Brown. I started Factor with the idea that I would be able to surround myself with talented artists, talented entrepreneurs, and talented machinists and mentors to kind of learn myself how the tools are used, by design, the space is many things to many people. We have a wide variety of members. I think that we have a lot of retired individuals that have worked in this industry before. They no longer have a workshop, they don't have even a garage. We also have a lot of new entrepreneurs that are looking to kind of create new companies, new designs, and they don't have the capital to buy the tools themselves or even get the warehouse space required to kind of do production. So we offer that ability for our members to come in, start their companies. Members have access to a number of tools to bring their ideas to fruition. We do 3D printing with laser cutting. Uh, we also do a wood shop and we do a metal shop and we have an electronics room as well. We have a laser machine that's used for cutting acrylic, for wood, for leather. And the machine itself runs for about $40,000 so it's very difficult for users or members that are starting companies to afford that capital outlay. Most Factor members pay a monthly fee. Others pay with their time and expertise. X Factor is an opportunity here at, at Factor where you can volunteer time to help teach classes or help teach people on different equipment in exchange for the membership fee. I volunteer here in the electronics room. All right, so this is uh, the intro to Arduino. Arduino is a set of open source software and hardware. The intro to Arduino class kind of helps people get started with the Arduino hardware. It teaches a lot of the basics of how to interface with the hardware, a little bit of the coding so that you can learn how to turn an LED on and off, how to get input from a button. By the time you're done, you've got a kind of a basic foundation to help build some type of project that you might be interested in. In addition to providing access to expensive tools, Factor serves as a place where ideas can cross-pollinate. I met another member here named Bill Ball, and together we both had a similar vision for a low-cost robot that people could learn 
about electronics and about robotics and about programming. And so we kind of worked together over a couple months and put together an initial prototype for this robot that our target is trying to keep it under $50. This project really wouldn't have been possible without Factor. Um, really more than anything, it's the opportunity to meet people who have similar interests, but different levels of expertise and different types of expertise. I feel like I'm kind of a creative person and I, and I have a lot of ideas and I like to be able to get those ideas out to a certain point to see if it's worth going further with it and being able to learn this stuff that'll teach other people. You kind of in turn learn a lot about your own ideas. For Douglas Brown, it's also important that Factor welcomes a broad range of creators. We're about as evenly demographic as possible. I mean, the concept there is we have an equal segment of artists that come in here that are looking to expand upon their art. One of the pieces that I'm best known for around town is the dinosaur skull out of cardboard. One of those artists is Bob Barnett. I do a lot of work where art and technology meet. I'm very inspired by science fiction, here I get to work with a lot of great engineers who have taught me a lot about uh, electrical engineering and computer programming. And they're helping me with the process of building a better version of all the different things that I build. This object exists in a niche of its own where it is the intersection of astronomy, computer programming, mechanical design, electronic design, graphic design, interface design, it has so many different aspects that it ties into for this specific piece. You can use it to point at objects in the sky and track them and take photographs of them, or you can use it to map an area of the sky. You could use it also for home security. You could plot the infrared temperatures of crops. I wanted to build it for the common user. It's only about 200 bucks to build the thing and it's all open source architecture so you can program it yourself to do what you'd like it to do. Factor may appear to be a cool workshop decked out with cutting edge tools, but ultimately, it's not just about shiny new hardware. Factor is about people. We have a number of really talented people that have kind of come out of the woodwork to come to Factor to kind of see their own dreams become a reality. And that's a wonderful thing because when you work for a job and you have a plethora of tools, but you can only work on those tools for somebody else. It's nice to be able to have the skill set to come someplace and work on those tools for yourself. So that's one of the pride things that we have in Factor. People should be empowered to be able to have the knowledge to, to create the ideas that they have so that they can share them with the world. The demand for trained people to fill technology jobs will only grow in the next decade. The Iron Yard Coding School is helping fill that demand by empowering adults to start second or even third careers in tech. Welcome to the Iron Yard. We are a 12-week intensive boot camp for people who are looking to start new careers as web developers and app developers. We have three courses and we do full-time training plus job placement to help people move into new careers. This is our front end classroom. We have 10 students in here right now. It is web development focused. This is our back-end web development class in Ruby on Rails. It isn't app development, it really is for web development for websites and back-end. This is our mobile class. We're running our second iteration of it and they do app development for iOS. So one of the most important things that we do with students is not just teaching them the vocabulary and the syntax that they need to know, but also teaching them to think like developers. Because I do think that that's a very different skill set and it's a learned skill set. It's not something that most people come with naturally. And so we have students from a variety of different work backgrounds, life experience backgrounds that are coming in and learning together. I was a martial arts instructor. Uh, I ran a karate school in Winter Park, just looking to change my career. I've been learning more in one week than I taught myself in nine months. Getting to see students that have come in with no technical experience and then take that to where they're actually employable and they're getting hired and they're making that life change that they've been trying to do, it's huge. There's nothing like it. When a student emails me or comes by to tell me that they've gotten a job offer that they're so excited about, I love it. It's the best feeling. The National STEM Initiative, the push to get kids to study science, technology, engineering, and math has taken off. But some educators think art has been left behind to students' detriment. 
We sat down with UCF professor Ryan Bisons to discuss what some are calling the STEAM initiative. So just first of all, tell me a little bit about the concept of STEAM. What is it? STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And the A in STEAM stands for art. So it's the, the addition of the, the arts into the um, mathematical and uh, technological fields. I thought that uh, STEM was created, the concept of STEM was created because there was a feeling that not enough students were going into the science fields. Uh, why are we introducing art into the equation now? Arts has been linked into the sciences since the, the Age of Enlightenment and both have a similar yet um, maybe a little bit different approach, but um, an artist is very explorative um, to, to um, whatever concept or ideas that they're exploring, and, and a scientist is the same way. And what about for the artist? What does the artist gain out of getting that grounding in science? The boom in technology and all the new tools and advancement in um, computers and um, things like 3D printing and um, the tangibility of media um, is really starting to transcend the fields and to be inspired or connected to these, these different um, uh, technologies or ideas will help inform the artist's work. Ryan Bison, thanks so much for explaining the concept of STEAM to us. Thank you. Autism is a growing problem in the United States. Researchers at the University of Central Florida, assisted by a precocious teenager, are creating a computer app to help affected families. So your job is to take care of the wubby and make it as mm. happy as you can. Mm -hmm. Autism poses major challenges for children and families. The disorder makes it difficult to read social cues and communicate verbally and non-verbally. It's also becoming more common. One in 68 individuals, according to the CDC, is diagnosed with autism. And so it's a, it's a very large number of individuals being diagnosed daily. And this epidemic has really caused a significant need at the public school level because there are a lot of kids coming and not a lot of folks that are trained to deal with the variety of skills those kids come to school with. To meet that need, Dr. Vasquez and Darren Hughes created a computer game that teaches autistic children some of the social skills they lack. The idea behind the game was that essentially you're putting the kid in the, the role of a caregiver. You have this character that we call the wubby, which is neither a boy nor girl, it's neither a cat nor a dog, but it has all the same basic needs that a kid might have. I think it was important that it seem non-threatening so we don't use many uh, harsh edges, everything's kind of rounded. Really it was uh, some trial and error and some guesswork, but I mean on some solid foundations of you know, trying to create an environment that is not overstimulating, but also uh, is clear enough that they understand it relates to their home environment. There's a section in the game where the wubby is hungry and you go to a kitchen and you start feeding it food. And really it's an opportunity for the child to determine empathy there. And also to maybe think about themselves in terms of these emotions. So, you know, oh, I'm hungry and maybe, you know, I remember the wubby was sad when the wubby was hungry. Well, maybe that's, you know, why I'm not feeling well right now. I think that it can give them necessary emotional skills to bond with one another and form relationships with each other. Sapna is assisting Hughes and Vasquez by recoding Woobies, so it works on common tablets and smartphones. For her, it's personal. In seventh grade, I actually volunteered in an autistic classroom, and a lot of the kids got made fun of so much by the other um, students in school, and I really wanted to help them out and make their life better. Sapna is also helping by testing the app. I held an interaction session between the Wobbies and a subject named CJ today, and I think it went pretty well because in the beginning he didn't really know what to do, but as he started playing around with the game, I saw him really focus on the health meters and focus on the areas that were red and caring for the Wobby where it needed it most. CJ's mom thinks the app holds great promise. Almost all of these kids are very screen oriented. They all have iPads, iPhones, iTouches, they all play computer games, they all do things. 
and it's easier for them to interact. We've discovered with CJ that if he's talking to someone over FaceTime or to the avatars, he will maintain eye contact. He will have more conversation just by using the screen. So what else can we do using the screen? So when Sapna said she had the app, I thought that's just the tip of the iceberg and people are just desperate for something like this. And here's, here's this young lady who's in high school who's creating this app working with Dr. Hughes and what can this do? We, you know, the possibilities are just endless. For the researchers, it was important to create a product that was both effective and widely available. Most companies will develop applications and they're in it for really to make uh, money and they're obviously there to develop these applications for mass downloads, purchases. We were really more interested in the developing an application to then really address specific skills, most notably the interrelational skills, the empathy skills, perspective taking skills. And we wanted to make sure that there was a strong research base to uh, demonstrate that there was a strong outcome of the game, uh, not only for parents but for our schools and the children to use and show hey yes this product not only is it fun but it also produces a great outcome for skills. Sapna has every intention of seeing that happen. My long-term research goal is based on two main projects. The first is expanding the Wubbies and then the second is involving another project called Teach Live and those are mixed reality avatars. Something like Teach Live is not going to be available to the mass population. Just the communication devices that they were using, some of them are $4,000. The cost is going to be very prohibitive for most people, but an app is not. You're starting to look at something that can just change everything for these kids and for these families. My long-term goal is to use the Wubbies as a diagnostic test to determine kids that can benefit from the Teach Live therapy. If the Wubbies can prove which children will benefit, parents of the kids will be a lot more likely to pay for that expensive therapy and help out the kids. We built the cafe around the harness. It's a 10 by 10 space and there's a U-ring at the top of the device and it's frictionless. That is what allows that individual to move anywhere within that 10 by 10 space. We're starting out with traumatic brain injury, but we certainly see that this technology has applications for individuals that are survivors of stroke, survivors of spinal cord injuries. The accident happened over 10 years ago and she was in a coma for four and a half months. She's always been a vivacious person, very active, and she likes to talk to people. So this gives her opportunity to do it on a regular basis. It gives me purpose. I can accomplish something. In our situation, our TBI survivors are taking the orders, and then they're going across to the other side of the cafe to retrieve those orders. They're working on things like memory. I have to walk and hear them, and then I have to walk and try to remember and get what they want. For Diana, she's working on some fine motor and dexterity. So her to be able to, to grab a hold of multiple items and bring them back. It is good because she can grab things and carry them over without having to fall down. Normally she cannot carry things from one place to another. Really what this does is it offers them an environment to showcase their potential, to demonstrate their capacity. If there wasn't this opportunity, they're sitting at home because there's not opportunities for them to be engaged in the real world, doing meaningful activities and contributing. And that's, that's what we know that they're capable of. They need to implement harnesses all over. So that we, as disabled people, we aren't just limited to therapy. We're just excited to have the opportunity to advocate for individuals with disabilities. So this is just us dipping our toe in the water and we think that there'll be many other individuals in our community that can benefit from the technology. Harnesses need to be everywhere so we can walk around like regular people because we are regular people. That's all for this week on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology.
Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfeld Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. Thank you.